Hi, I'm Jill Maurer. Welcome to my channel. On my channel, we talk about design and we talk about all aspects of design and design is everywhere. This past week, Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I live and work, experienced a very large downtown fire. And as I was watching this fire unfold, it became obvious to me that there was a true design to how to fight this fire. And these men and women were implementing a design that they had never experienced before. They were fighting a fire they'd never experienced before, but by design, they knew what they were doing. And Raleigh is a small town, and I happened to know one of the firefighters who was fighting this fire. And I had the good fortune today to talk to him about fighting the fire and the design for fighting fires in general. I hope you enjoyed the interview. What was, what was fascinating about the fire was people were watching this going, this is amazing. Like our firefighters have never, I don't think, have ever seen anything like this. We certainly have never seen anything this big and this amazing. And yet you showed up and you just got going. Like you see this every day and you knew what to do. So when I saw that, I thought that, I mean, it has to be by design. There's no other way. That's a master design at work. And so I'd love to understand how did you know what to do in a massive downtown fire? And it is, it's exactly a design. It was, we call it our fire ground procedure. And it's a document that we use to work off of as kind of a loose framework for what each unit is going to be assigned to do at a fire or at whatever type of emergency scene we're going to. For that particular fire, it's interesting that you say that people were, because we, I'm coming on the second alarm. Mm -hmm. And so the first units are there and operating and they call for the second alarm as soon as they arrived. And so we're a few minutes behind them. And as we're coming over the hill, getting to the point where we can see the downtown area, there was just a collective, oh, wow, <laughs> right. in the fire truck. Right. None of us had ever seen anything like that before. When we go into a, a normal house fire, it's usually compartmentalized where, uh, you know, the living room is on fire. Well, we can go into the living room, spray a little bit of water, and shut the door behind us, and that water converts to steam and expands greatly and snuff the fire out. Oh, interesting. And you just you can't that you can't do that in a building like that. You have to spray water on every piece of wood that's on fire to put it out. People had been calling me because I, I my studio is downtown and it isn't far from that fire. Yeah. My attitude they were asking me if I was nervous, if I was scared. You know, no, because if it, it was ten o'clock at night, I didn't have any people in it. Um, if it's an empty building, I mean, you know, yeah, I don't own the building, but it's the, the people are what matter and everything in the building could be replaced. Mm -hmm. Um, the quorum center and the, the different condos are a different story, a way different story. 10 o'clock at night, There's that's when everybody there. is home. Yeah. That's, that's what I would be afraid for, not for an office building that was all but empty. And that enters into our, we, we kind of call it what mode we're going to be in when we arrive on scene. And we use things like what time of day it is, if there's cars in the driveway, what kind of, what type of building it is. And we knew that the Quorum Center has residential and we knew it had office in the lower floors. And so we knew that if we had people in there, uh, they were probably going to be five to 15 stories up. Right. And the apartments on the other side, you know, those guys knew that there were people in those apartments. So that, you know, that changes our response mode. It changes what, what mode our priorities can fall into. We arrive on a house fire in the middle of the night and there's cars in the driveway. We, unless somebody says, hey, you know, everybody's out, we assume there's people in there. And right. we operate as if it's a rescue because right. more than likely it is. The, I have another question about that bucket because I, I remember thinking, I saw that video, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I know Ralph, and he seems so sane, this man, <laughs> and yet here's this evidence. Um, I, I, I look at that and I think, there is no way I'm getting in that bucket. I mean, fire or no fire, first of all, to get in that bucket and go up high, and then to have a fire. I, I, the only way I can imagine being in that bucket 
is if I were just somewhere worse. There's times when that's the best thing you've seen all day right. is that bucket coming to you. Yes. <laughs> I'm yes. A lot of people say there's no way I'd get in that bucket. There's no way you keep me out of that bucket. Really? That's my job. Yeah. That's what I do. And that's, this is an event that, it's a hundred year event. I will never get this chance again. And I've got a story related to that. When I got, we get to the scene, we get parked, we get up on the ladder, and I'm the first one in the bucket, and I turn around, and the firefighter that has followed me into the bucket is not the one that I expected. He's the, he says, I pulled rank. I'm not missing this. Oh, really? Yes. So it wasn't your normal part? Well, it was one of my firefighters, right. but we have specific assignments on the truck. That, and the two firefighters in the back s switch off every day. Okay. And they each, so they each know how to do each assignment. But that day was not his day to be in the bucket. Right. He pulled rank. He wasn't going to miss it. Really? Yes. So here we're all going, uh, I'm not going to have any relationship with that bucket. And you are fighting to, we're, to get in We're, it. yeah. So how hot are you? That, that is one of we the were not. We were not hotter. We could feel, you can feel the radiant heat, but it's not, it's not to any degree hot for us to be in the bucket. Okay. Now, one thing that that bucket has is a sprinkler on the bottom. Okay. As soon as we have water coming up the waterway to feed those nozzles, that sprinkler is pressurized. And if it gets above a certain temperature, it will do a fog right. under the bucket to protect the bucket from that heat. So it knows, and we have a lever in the bucket that we can pull to activate it too. If we feel like we're getting hot, yeah. we can activate that and it'll keep the bucket cool. Do, do you still have that fire pole that you get to go down to? Is it really still there? We have three stations that still have fire poles. Two of, those, two of those are, are imminently getting replaced and the third one's probably not that far behind it. So there will come a day in the not too distant future that we won't have any fire poles. Oh, I, as a little girl, I, you know, classes would always visit fire stations, and if we wanted to, we got to go down the pole, and, you know, I was the little gymnast and whatever, and I just, I was first down that pole. I mean, I, I just loved it. Yeah. And I was thinking about that the other day, that with, you know, with the way things are today, probably if there's a class, you can't necessarily let them no. go down that. No. Yeah. We you also, have to be on the payroll to go down right. the pole. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. This is another thing that I don't know if people know, and I don't know if you still do it, but when I, when I bought my very first house, I really didn't know what I was doing about anything about owning a house. And it, the house had been built in 1929, and I called the fire department and said, you know, can you look at this and just tell me if there's something I should do? And the, the guy comes out, and um, we were talking about the fireplace, because there was this fireplace. And I just wasn't sure if I could use it. And mm -hmm. he said to me, well, it is built to code because in 1929 there was no code. Mm -hmm. But I can promise you that if you burn a fire in this fireplace, we will meet again. <laughs> <laughs> and I met a nice man, but I really didn't want to meet him again. No. So I, 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 I never, ever, flowers. We always say, hope and, we don't see you later. Don't right. take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> right. I remember. You were the one, actually, who was in my house one day and asked me if I had a, a plan. Escape plan. A, an escape plan. And, you know, I'd sort of thought about it, and you know, but you were like, okay, let's figure this out. Yeah. And, you know, now we had a plan. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, so for sure, even to the point of knowing where to be when you're outside so that the firefighters can see you. Because if your meeting place is somewhere they can't see you, they're going to go in for no reason. And there have been, there's been fires, numerous, who knows how many, but I can think of a couple that I've researched. One was in Virginia. The fire department arrived at about five o'clock in the morning and cars in the driveway, it looks like it's occupied, nobody's standing outside. And so they went in and started searching. Mm -hmm. The family had all escaped and had gone next door to the neighbor's house and was inside the neighbor's house. Nobody came out and met the fire department and told them everybody's out. And mm -hmm. a firefighter lost his life in, oh. that, in that fire. Yeah. It was, that was a windy day. And the wind pushed the fire upstairs and caused a flash over. See, when I, when I was in school, they would tell you to have a, fi a plan and to get out. But that was the piece that was missing. You know, and be somewhere that you can tell the firefighters. Yes. That's... 
from our perspective, that's critical. It changes our whole operation mode. Right. We, uh, and telling the dispatcher, when you call, whoever calls, tell the dispatcher. People are still in there or everybody's out. Because that we're not going to completely take that 100% because communication being what it is, sometimes mm -hmm. it's not always accurate. But it's just, it helps. That's part of the plan. And if you have a plan, and if you have working smoke detectors, and you're, you know, you've looked over your house, and you know what you're going to do, you are 90% more likely to get out alive. Um, and how long have you been fighting fires? 23 years. So, in that time, what has, what has changed? So sort of about either the design of kind of how you approach the fire and how you attack it, or even the equipment? Well, I say 23 years, but it's actually, I started as a volunteer firefighter in about 1985 in my hometown and worked for a department for a couple of years and then went to college. So it's actually been 30 plus years that I've, since I started. Right. So yeah, there's been a lot of change in the equipment, especially. Uh, the trucks that we have now are state of the art. Everybody's enclosed in a cab. And in the old days, a lot of fire trucks didn't even have roofs. Right. You know, yeah. and you know, the jump seats on the back where the firefighters were actually riding basically outside. And that has all changed. Everything's a lot safer as far as the trucks and they can do more. They're, the pumps are usually are bigger and the ladders are stronger and they'll do more. We can do a lot of things with this ladder truck. It's, it's these trucks that they build nowadays are amazing what they will do. Uh, and fires have changed in that amount of time. Yeah. Building construction is different now. Lightweight construction uh, trusses and a lot of um, lightweight kind of engineered wood that they use to build houses nowadays, and it burns a lot faster and a lot hotter. And the things that are in houses, the, the, the furniture and the clothing is a lot more synthetic, and it burns different than wood, cotton, ordinary materials. So the fires have actually gotten worse. The fires get hotter faster, yes. Wow, that's interesting. When I looked at that fire and other people looked at it, I mean, one of the things that we were thinking is there is just no amount of money. There is, n I can think of no amount of money that would make me willing to, now, I would fight a fire in a pinch. But to wake up every day and know that that's my plan, that's what I'm going to do. I can't even imagine, you know, jockeying to get in that bucket. Um, no amount of money. I mean, how does that, how does that work? What, what makes you want to do this? It's, it's obviously, it's not the money that motivates us because none of us are going to be rich. Right. You know, it's, it's money is always an issue for a firefighter, not just here, but anywhere. Uh, it's just it's like school teachers and and police and military and you know it's it's not something you do for the money for me and I think for most most of us guys and girls we're problem solvers and we like helping people and that's what motivates us and the fact that we were able to get there and get that fire stopped from spreading and even if it's not save people, save their stuff. Because even though they're not going to be able to get into their houses or their homes for extended period of time, their stuff isn't gone, mm -hmm. you know. If that's all we can do, that's that motivates us. Well, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me about it. It's, it's fascinating, and it's nice to... Kind of know somebody on the inside and to, to, to understand your perspective um, and your your take on it it's yeah. just I can't say enough how amazing it was to see just how well prepared you were and where we're all going oh my word I can't believe this you guys came in and just went you got this that's validation that. for us that's right. validation that what we've been doing all these years has paid off Right. That we, you know, we were doing what we we're supposed to be doing, yes. training wise, right. and that the plan that we have in place, the design for what we're supposed to do, works. 
I hope you enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much to Ralph Ripper for sharing with us his expertise and his knowledge. And thank you to firefighters everywhere for preparing every day to keep us safe. If you'd like to learn more about the Raleigh Fire, I've got several links below. Let me know what you think about the interview in the comments below, including if you'd like to see more interviews about design. I upload videos every week, and I hope you'll subscribe. See you next week.